So welcome everybody to this IFLA webinar on the upcoming Asia Pacific meeting on libraries and exceptions to copyright. Today, it's going to be me, Stephen Weiber, manager of the policy and advocacy team at IFLA, and my colleague Ariadna, policy and research officer. We'll share our emails at the end if you have any further questions. And I wanted also to thank Violetta and all of the other colleagues here at IFLA headquarters who've helped organize this event. So both this webinar and the meeting we'll be talking about are the first in a series. In addition to the Asia Pacific seminar at the end of next month, the one we'll be talking about today, there will also be events in Africa and Latin America and the Caribbean. We will also be doing webinars ahead of these meetings. Now, while much of the content of these webinars will be similar, we'll be adapting each one to the region we'll be talking about. So, in addition to an explanation of what the regional seminars are about, why we think they're important, what our objectives are, and how you can get involved, we'll also be sharing some initial analysis of what we know about exceptions and limitations to copyright for libraries in the region. Now, I've used a lot of technical words there, and it's important to note that this is not a webinar designed for experts, at least not only for experts. While the language and laws around copyright may seem inaccessible just for the few, its impacts are far reaching. Copyright is an issue everywhere, from school or village libraries to the biggest university or national libraries. They matter for all of us. And as you're here, it's important that we make as many voices as possible heard in order to show how important it is that we make change happen. And that's why we are so happy to have, to have you on the call with us today. The webinar slides and the recording will be made available afterwards on the IFLA webpage. So please feel free to share the link further with your colleagues, encourage them to listen, and most importantly, encourage them to engage. Now, we should do a little explanation of the tool that we're using, Zoom. Some of you may know it already, but I'm going to share a couple of instructions because this is a new one for you as well. Now, first of all, congratulations for connecting. Um, that's the first stage. Now, if you're having problems with the audio, there is on the left uh, the audio settings button. Now, hopefully those who can't hear can read right now. If you have a technical question, please use the chat option. You can see the arrow pointing to that in the middle. And our colleague Violetta will answer any questions you have. We're also keen that you can make use of the time to ask questions and make suggestions. And we'll leave time for this at the end. Now, if you have questions, please use the questions and answer button, Q&A. And you can send these questions at any moment and we'll look to answer them all at the end of the webinar in the time we have. So, why WIPO? So, to give you some background about the regional seminars, we need to explain a little bit why IFLA gets involved in WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization. Now, WIPO is the United Nations agency responsible for intellectual property. This includes patents, trademarks, and copyright, for example. These are seen as important as a driver of growth. Many companies and countries today rely on ideas rather than physical products to earn money. In the case of copyright, this is the right held by a creator of a work or whoever receives this right from a creator to decide how the work is used. Of course, such rights are restricted in time. They only last for a certain number of years but they can also be subject to other exceptions or limitations. And this is something we'll be talking about. As a UN agency, WIPO is open to all United Nations member states to join, and almost all are. I think we're at 191 right now. Once they're members, governments can then attend WIPO committees. And these committees exist in each of the big areas of intellectual property. Its copyright committee is called the Standing Committee on Copyright and Related Rights, SCCR, and we'll be talking quite a lot about this one. Now, WIPO is active in a number of areas. 
It provides a lot of capacity building and training at the national level. It manages databases and provides tools for intellectual property offices. It also registers patents and trademarks internationally. It does a lot of work to produce valuable research and guidelines for policymakers, creators, and users of intellectual property around the world, including libraries. But its most pro high profile work is doubtless what it does to negotiate treaties. Such treaties are essential in order to support the recognition of the rights of creators from one country to in another and vice versa. In doing so, they make it easy to exchange and to work across borders. And they're a far more efficient way of doing things than bilateral agreements between one government and another. But it's important to note that such texts don't only need to be about rights. They can also be about exceptions to rights and how these work across borders. The Marrakesh Treaty, to facilitate access to published works for people who are blind, visually impaired, or otherwise print disabled, is an example of this. It allows people who have print disabilities, as well as the institutions and organisations that help them, to take copies of works into accessible formats, so for example Braille, or large print, or DAISY, and to share these across borders. This allows us to deal with the problem that in many countries there simply is no access to such works. Without this exception, the market would fail as it has failed for many years. Now, while these treaties may be more efficient than bilateral agreements, there are still complications. Once a treaty is agreed, it is still necessary for countries to join. We talk about ratification or accession. These countries also often need to change their laws domestically before people can use them properly, use the new possibilities properly. Nonetheless, and despite these complications, as we've seen with Marrakesh, the existence of a treaty can have a major impact on national laws. Now, working through WIPO therefore represents a very important opportunity for libraries, both in our work to update national copyright laws and to make it easier for libraries to work across borders. Both of these are necessary in the modern age. Copyright laws in many countries have become obsolete as the way we access, share and create works has changed thanks to digital technology. Such changes are needed just for libraries to keep up and to continue delivering on their public interest mission. At the same time, the world is becoming more global Libraries are working together more in order to support research, to reunite heritage, and to realise the potential of their collections in other ways. When copyright regimes are too different from one country to the next, or when they explicitly prevent cooperation across borders, such laws stand in the way of progress, as well as in the way of the expectations of library users. WIPO can help to, to resolve this problem. Now, it's important to note that clearly this solution can only be partial. Copyright reforms are not a replacement for proper financial support for our institutions. And the same goes for museums, archives, schools and research centres. But, as we have seen with Marrakesh, a treaty or similar international legal instrument can make an important difference, both as a driver of domestic legal change and an enabler of international cooperation. And indeed, this is what IFLA and partners such as IFL, the International Council on Archives and the International Council on Museums, as well as Education International, are calling for. Action around exceptions and limitations has been on the agenda at WIPO since around 2007, and IFLA has been engaged since the beginning. Based on studies by Professor Kenneth Cruz and the inputs of IFLA, its partners and member states, the committee has explored these provisions in copyright law that allow cultural heritage institutions to perform their missions. These are exceptions, of course, that allow for preservation, for reproduction, for research or private uses, for interlibrary loan, and of course, for public lending. While there's been progress, some members, mainly the European Union, have blocked discussions from going further. They argue that they do not want an international legal instrument 
despite committing to such a thing in 2012. And this is why our advocacy work is so important. Decision makers need to understand the importance of exceptions and limitations to copyright for libraries. Now, as underlined, IFLA's position since 2011 has been to promote an international treaty as a solution. One that sets a basic foundation for all countries, that creates a framework for national copyright laws that is flexible and consistent with existing international law. One that does not necessarily seek to impose a harmonization or a one size fits all approach, but that does work across borders. This is what we've seen with Marrakesh. And as mentioned earlier, Marrakesh has boosted change at the national level and given legal provisions that have a cross border effect. In terms of what IFLA and its partners are calling for explicitly, we would like, you can see the list on the screen, library lending, library document supply, preservation of library and archive materials, use of works and other materials under related rights for the benefit of persons with disabilities, those who aren't yet covered by the Marrakesh Treaty, use of works for education, research and private study, use of work for personal and private purposes, and access to orphan works. These are all activities that, without exceptions, can't take place without payment or without the permission of rights holders, something that for most is either too expensive or simply is impractical. But nonetheless, these are things that allow our institutions to do what they are mandated to do. We also argue that libraries should be allowed to carry out parallel importation. This refers to when libraries can buy books from abroad even when they are already on sale or someone has to write this right to sell them locally. We've seen, for example, in recent Australian evidence that without this provision, books risk being extremely expensive in one country for no good reason. We also ask for the possibility to make cross-border uses of works and other materials reproduced under a limitation or exception. We also ask that contract terms which cancel out exceptions to copyright and related rights should not have effect. There should also be the right to remove or get around technological protection measures that prevent libraries, archives and museums from making use of exceptions. Finally, we're calling on a limit for a limitation on liability for libraries and archives. This is necessary. In Afghanistan, for example, libraries and archives are responsible for checking what users are doing with books and other materials. This is impractical. It places a huge and almost impossible burden on colleagues there. It should be enough to inform, to let people know about the possibilities. Libraries cannot police every use that's made of works. It's worth noting as well that just as the libraries, archives and museum sector is working to promote a treaty, the education and research sector, sector is also working on a similar document. So, as mentioned earlier, progress has not necessarily been easy. Representatives of some countries, and we mentioned the European Union, have blocked efforts by groups of developing countries in particular to move towards some sort of law, some sort of international document that would give members the impetus to pass laws domestically and the possibility for libraries, archives and museums to work internationally. Nonetheless, this time has been useful. We have seen a number of studies that have not only underlined how diverse national provisions are and how many countries lack modern exceptions and limitations to copyright for their libraries, archives and museums. Now, with this evidence, with these facts, it's time to move forwards. Seeing this, the WIPO Secretariat proposed an action plan a list of activities that would help move the committee, move member states towards international consensus on a way forwards on this topic. One of the most important points in this are the regional meetings. And as mentioned at the beginning, WIPO is organizing three of these. Quoting from the action plans themselves, agreed by member states a year ago, their goal is to analyze the situation of libraries, archives and museums as well as of educational and research institutions and areas for action, 
with respect to the limitations and exceptions regime and the specificities of the region. The first of these will take place in Singapore and will cover the Asia Pacific region on 29th 30th of April. This will take place at the National Library Board. It's worth noting that WIPO's Asia Pacific region covers much the same as IFLA's Asia Pacific region with the exception of Australia, New Zealand and Japan who belong to the group of developed countries and China which is its own group. The second meeting will be for Africa and will be held in Nairobi, Kenya. The third and last one will be held in the Dominican Republic for Latin America and the Caribbean. The main participants at these meetings will be officials from copyright offices from all countries in the region. There will also be some WIPO officials and of course civil society organizations such as IFLA, the International Council on Archives, the International Council on Museums, IFOL, in Education International, which is the Global Federation of Education Unions, and of course those organisations defending the interests of right holders. Now, this meeting, these meetings are a unique chance to make the case for international action. Decision makers from all over the region, these representatives of copyright offices, will be there, will be discussing the topic, Rather than the theoretical debates between delegates that we tend to see in Geneva, these meetings will hear about what is happening on the ground. What are the challenges? What are the issues? What are the difficulties that libraries, archives, museums, as well as those involved in education and research are facing? We have an important chance to raise awareness around these challenges, why they find it difficult, when they find it difficult to preserve and to provide access to cultural heritage and information to support research and education. We need to explain also why the national approach is not enough and collaboration at the international level is needed. We need to show how effective libraries benefiting from proper laws can bring benefits to society and deliver on the sustainable development goals. After these three regional seminars have taken place, the conclusions gathered will be brought to an international conference on exceptions and limitations. This will take place in October in Geneva, right before WIPO's, the next meeting of WIPO's Copyright Committee. This is the committee where officially they will take decisions about next steps. What is said in Singapore in April, in Nairobi in June, in Santo Domingo in July, Will have an echo and will help build momentum for change. So now I'm going to hand over to Ariadna who will share more information about the current situation for libraries in the region. Thank you Stephen. Um, so as Stephen mentioned one of the very useful things that WIPO has done uh, in the past years with regards to our sectors um, has done to, uh, is to commission studies that look at existing exceptions and limitations to copyright for our institutions also for um, archives, museums, uh, and for educational research purposes. So uh, the study for libraries has been developed by Professor Kenneth Cruz and updated twice, uh, sorry, three times actually, uh, last time in 2017. Um, so we've, got a, we've had a look at this study uh, and we have used it to look at the landscape of exceptions and limitations to copyright in the Asia Pacific region. And we're happy to present you some of the first findings. We, we've seen that in the region, there are still countries with no exceptions and limitations to copyright for libraries at all. This is uh, Laos, um, Tuvalu, and Yemen. We've also seen there, there is clearly a lack of adequate exceptions when looking at the exceptions that the library sector considers necessary and that would allow the very basic public interest activities conducted by libraries um, as as a reference, we've taken the ones listed uh, in our uh, idea of uh, an international treaty, as Stephen mentioned before. And um, we see, regrettably, that most countries in the region are very far from getting there. As you see on the screen, and I'm going to mention a few of them, uh, we see that, for instance, the right to parallel importation is only recognized in one country. Um, the right to library and archive lending and temporary access is also, is also only recognized in one country. 
the right of reproduction and supply of copies by libraries and archives uh, is recognized in six countries. Um, the study, I think, focused on uh, around 41 countries um, because there's a few more countries in the region that do not have a copyright law at all. Um, for instance, the use of orphan works and materials protected by related rights uh, was only referred to in three legislations. The right to translate works and materials protected by related rights uh, was only referred to in one country. Um, and then other provisions, uh, for instance, the, the, the exemption to, to override TPM, technological, technological protection measures, excuse me, um, is referred to in 21 countries, uh, out of which only two have an exception to this rule for, uh, for libraries and our institutions, and cultural heritage institutions. Um, there's also, uh, we've also talked about the limitation of liability of library professionals, but only one country has such a provision. And then finally, the legal deposit um, only appears in two countries. Uh, um, another thing we've been looking at, uh, an important one, is how much these legislations are adapted to the digital world. We've taken a few, um, a few provisions as a reference to analyze this, this matter. Um, one of them is um, the number of copies that can be made. We see that only 14 countries, so that, excuse me, 14 countries out of the, out of the 41 analyzed have provisions that limit the number of copies that can be made for preservation purposes. This is obviously a very outdated provision that doesn't fit the digital world uh, and the possibilities that this brings. We've also seen um, often a reference to works in the permanent collection. Um, this condition also um, doesn't take into consideration the fact that many works at, are currently accessed through licensing agreements and that therefore they are not permanently located in the library collections, but are still an important part of library collections. We've also seen um, a lot of references to specific ways of making copies, such as reprographic, which obviously doesn't fit technological evolution, and we defend um, a provision that is techno technology neutral so that this doesn't happen. Um, and finally, we've also seen um, the lack of reference to, to provisions that are actually very important in the digital world, for instance, transitory copies, which are part, uh, a very important part of computer processes and that require an exception to copyright law, to the right of reproduction, namely. Um, or, uh, the, as Stephen mentioned before, the need to recognize that if a contract overrides a legal provision, um, it is not applicable. This is also uh, not covered in most of the countries. We've only seen Kuwait uh, having such a provision. Uh, and finally, also an important aspect that tells, tells us a little bit about how laws are changing um, in the region. Uh, we've seen that in many countries, the copyright law has remained unchanged for over 20 years. So it is obviously not following up with uh, technological evolution. And now back to Stephen, thank you. Thank you, Ariadna. So if I was going to be present at this re regional seminar in Singapore, and we will use this opportunity to defend the interests of the profession and to call for copyright regimes that favor access to information. We'll be bringing examples of the work that libraries do in the region and how it's impacted by copyright for the good or for the bad. We will also underline the benefits of cross-border collaboration and the need for an international treaty. We'll work closely together with archives, museums, education, and research organizations in order to defend common needs and ensure that our voices are heard in the room. And on this slide, you can see the logos of some of the organizations with which we'll be working. However, it is still member states themselves who will have the most powerful voices. They are the ones whose contributions will feed into the discussions in Geneva. They are the ones who will take the final decisions about WIPO's future work. To ensure that they do this, it is vital that they are prepared before they travel. And this is where you come in. In short, we need you to convince your government of the importance of the right copyright laws, both nationally and internationally, to convince them to come to the regional meeting in Singapore for Asia Pacific and to speak up 
to highlight the need for action. Now here's, how, here's some ideas on how you can do it. A first step is to identify your national representative to SCCR, the Standing Committee on Copyright and Related Rights. As we mentioned, almost every UN member state is represented at WIPO. If you can't find out from your copyright office, ask IFLA who went to the previous meeting, if anyone did, and you'll see our contact details at the end. You can of course look for yourself. You can see a link on the slide to WIPO's own list of copyright and intellectual property offices. And when we share these slides on the event page for this webinar at the end, you can look at that link and follow it and see who's in charge of copyright in your country. Then, we recommend you to write to them. It's useful ahead of SCCR, which will take place in early April, and the regional seminars, to highlight what libraries are doing and what's at stake. We need to make sure that they have heard about the concerns of our sector, of what we need, how they can help us help the population. It's important that also that they hear support for an international treaty from our sector and we'll provide you with ideas on how to do this. You can also help by sharing examples of how copyright impacts your work. These will help us show the work that you're doing to your representatives. This is one of the most valuable pieces of information in our, in our advocacy efforts, and it's one that only you can provide. If you're interested in learning more about our work at WIPO, we did a webinar last year and you can join, you can watch this again. You can follow us on social media where we use the hashtag copyright for libraries, both during the regional seminars and whenever we publish anything about copyright. And of course, you can apply to join the IFLA Advisory Committee on the Copyright and Other Legal Matters Network. This is a worldwide group of experts on copyright and libraries. You can share news on copyright reforms in your country as well as receiving updates on our work with SCCR and find many allies ready to help you in your advocacy work. So we've come to the end of our talk and um, we'd be very happy to hear any questions. So please make use of the questions and answers option and we'll be very happy to answer. So we've had one question through the chat. Um, what will the NGO involvement at the meeting be like? So the agendas for these meetings are still being defined. What we know is that there will be a very heavy focus on making them interactive. So after initial presentations from the organizers, from the Deputy Secretary General of WIPO, and from others potentially, there will be at least an afternoon and a morning of workshops. Now, clearly the priority will go to representatives of member states from the region. This is logical, but given the workshop format, there should be plenty of opportunity for library representatives to stand up, to, in, to engage in the conversation, to share their own examples, to be heard, and we hope to implement. It's always worth remembering as well that in these meetings, the coffee breaks are particularly important. This is a great opportunity to catch up with someone who said something interesting, to lobby, to advocate, to share materials. We hope, of course, that for those of you living in countries where copyright reforms are underway, you will be able to share this with us and we can use the opportunity, just as we do in Geneva, to, to, to make arguments, to find out where the copyright reform has got to, to underline why they should include libraries. So while we won't be in the front line, like the member states, we will be there, we will be able to talk, we will be able to engage, and with your help, we'll be able to have an influence. Are there any further questions? Well, if not, um, I'd like on behalf of Ariadna and myself to thank you very much for attending this meeting. For those of you who are listening to the recording afterwards, please use our contact details and you can see them on the screen at the moment in order to ask us for further information. 
As said, please share the link to this webinar so that others can listen. Um, and of course, we will be in touch shortly with further information about the meeting in Singapore, with suggestions on how you can get in touch with your own copyright offices, and how you can help us make a case for better copyright laws for libraries everywhere. Thank you. Thank you.